This one is a very interesting GMAT data sufficiency question. I'll classify this one as a 700 level GMAT DS question. It's on the topic number properties. The beauty about this question, in quite a few data sufficiency questions, we would have done this. We would have plugged in values, we would have picked numerical examples to figure out whether a statement is sufficient or not. Usually we'll say, go with a counter example, plug in numbers. In one case it works, one it does not work, so on and so forth. The trouble with doing that in this question is, you might be left wondering, have you evaluated all cases? So plugging in numbers may not be the best way to go about this question. The methodology, the logic that we'll be using to evaluate the statements, to check whether they are sufficient, the process that we'll be adopting in this particular question is something we can think of as a framework if you come across statements of this kind. Let's get started with the question. Let's read the stem first. Is the two-digit positive integer P a prime number? We'll pick key data at the question stem. It says it's a positive integer. It says it's a two-digit positive integer. Make a note of this information. Keep track of those. They are going to be quite useful in many questions. Certainly in this question, this information is going to come in handy to determine whether the statements are sufficient. Before we read the statements, let's answer the customary two questions. First one, what kind of an answer will this question fetch? This is a NIST question. Anything that starts with a B verb, the answer is to be an yes or a no. When is the data sufficient? The operative word is definite. If I get a definite yes, data is sufficient. If I get a definite no, data is sufficient. So even if I get a definite no, the data is sufficient. That's good enough at this stage. Let's not invest any more time in this. Let's move into the statements. Start with the first statement. Of the two statements, in my mind, the first statement is easier than the second one to find an answer, to determine whether it is sufficient. We have P plus 2 and P minus 2 are prime. Let's get started. We're going to build the logic with some inferences and some results thrown in. Let's draw the first inference right now. I'm going to write it in ascending order. P minus 2 obviously is a smaller number. P plus 2 is going to be a larger number. P actually snugly fits in between, exactly in between P minus 2 and P plus 2. We know P is a two-digit positive integer. So P plus 2 has to be a two-digit positive integer. And P minus 2 is certainly a positive integer, even if it is not two-digit. And the quick look at these three numbers, we know that these three numbers are in an AP with a common difference of 2. That is established. We have three positive integers whose common difference is 2. Then these three positive integers necessarily will have to be consecutive even or consecutive odd positive integers. Right? Is this okay? I can pick a number which is 12, 14, 16. Three consecutive positive integers, you will realize that their common difference is 2. They are in an AP. Or it could very well be 11, 13, 15. These are three consecutive odd positive integers and these three numbers have a common difference of 2 and in an AP. Now, if P minus 2 is prime and P plus 2 is prime, they cannot be three consecutive even integers. We cannot find more than one even integer, which is a prime number. So obviously, three consecutive even is ruled out. So the first inference we are drawing is P minus 2, P and P plus 2 are three consecutive odd integers. The second result which is going to come in handy in evaluating the statement is this. Let's write three consecutive odd integers. I'm just going to pick some random one. Not bothering initially to check whether P minus 2 and P plus 2 are prime. We'll come to that later. I'm just focusing only on this consecutive odd right now. Picking some number like 75, 77, 79. These are three consecutive odd. Let's pick one more set. I'm going to pick something like 107, 109, 111. Pick something much larger than that. Say something like 1002. Sorry, 1001 does not be odd. 1001, 1003, and 1005. Some such thing. Pick anything. And if you don't want such large numbers, go with smaller numbers. Is one of these three numbers divisible by 3? 75 is. Is one of these three numbers divisible by 3? 111 is. Is one of these three numbers divisible by 3? 1005 is. So the result that we are going to draw is basically in three consecutive odd integers. And for that matter, it's going to work even with three consecutive even integers. In three consecutive odd integers, one of those three numbers is going to be divisible by three. This is the property or this is the result we are going to use. So we're going to draw an inference right now. The question mentions that P plus 2 is a prime number. And we know it's a two-digit prime number. Two-digit prime number can never be divisible by three. So this number P plus 2 is not divisible by three. The question mentions P minus 2 is also prime, which means this is not going to be divisible by 3. We know P minus 2, P and P plus 2 are three consecutive odd integers. One of them should be divisible by 3. We have established P plus 2 being a prime number cannot be divisible by 3. P minus 2 being a prime number cannot be divisible by 3. That leaves us with only one possibility that P has to be divisible by 3. If P is divisible by 3 and P is a two-digit positive integer, then P cannot be a number which is a prime number. 
the only prime number that is divisible by 3 is a 3, which is not a two-digit number. We know p is a two-digit number. So if p is divisible by 3, then p is certainly not a prime number is what we can conclude. Is there any exception to this rule? It will be unfair if you don't look at the exception. There is one exception. Let's see if that makes sense in this particular case. The exception will happen when p minus 2 is a 3, p is equal to a 5 and p plus 2 is a 7. We said if p minus 2 is a prime number, it cannot be divisible by 3. What if it ended up being a 3 itself? That is an exception. But in that exception, we know p is equal to 5, which is not a two digit number. So this exception does not hold good for us. In If this two digit had not been mentioned, you had a factor in this exception and therefore the statement would not have been sufficient. Given the fact that it is a two digit number, this exception does not hold good. We can conclude that p is certainly a number which is not prime. So statement 1 alone is sufficient. If 1 alone is sufficient, eliminate choices B, C, E, we are down to A or D. To decide whether it is A or D, let us evaluate statement 2 as well. 2 is a very interesting statement. Let us again build the logic in this fashion. It says P minus 4 and P plus 4 are prime numbers is what we have. Okay, let us write these numbers in an ascending order. P minus 4, P plus 4 is what we have. I am not going to plug in a P in a hurry. I will come to that in, in a minute. P plus 4, I am going to go 3 numbers lesser than this and I am going to go to a P plus 1. P plus 4, when divided by 3, whatever remainder we are going to get, we will get the same remainder when P plus 1 is also divided by 3 because the difference between these two numbers is a 3. Let us take an example. Let us say I am picking P plus 4 to be a 17. So P plus 1 is going to be 3 lesser than that. So this number is going to be a 14. 17 divided by 3, the remainder is 2. 14 divided by 3, the remainder is 2. So, it's quite evident. If you keep adding or subtracting 3 to a number, whatever is the, the original number, let's say is an x, it left you a remainder of r when divided by 3. You add a 3 to x and then you check out, the remainder is going to remain the same. Or you subtract a 3 from x, you're going to find out the remainder is going to be the same. So, that's the first inference I'm going to draw. p plus 4 and p plus 1 are going to leave the same remainder when they are divided by 3. Right? That is the first inference. So because we are going to use a similar logic that we used to the earlier statement. That divisibility by 3, which among these numbers, how many of these numbers should be divisible by 3 is what we are going to use to evaluate statement 2 as well. Let us go on to this side and check out. I am going to pick a number which is 3 more than this. I am going to pick a p minus 1. Same logic holds good. p minus 4 when divided by 3, if it left you a remainder of r, 3 more than that which is p minus 1 when divided by 3 is also going to leave you a remainder of r. For example, let us say this number is equal to 11. 11 divided by 3, we know the remainder is equal to 2. p minus 1 is 3 more than that. p minus 4 is this. This is going to be 3 more than that. This number is going to be a 14 divided by 3, which is also going to leave us a remainder of 2. The second inference, p minus 4 and p minus 1 leave the same remainder when they are divided by 3. Just run through this because p minus 4, add a 3 to it. If this left a remainder of r, this should also leave a remainder of r. So this much is done till this point. Now, look at it. If p plus 4 is a prime number, it certainly is not divisible by 3. So it's going to leave some remainder. So if p plus 4 is going to leave a remainder, p plus 1 is also going to leave a remainder. p plus 4 is not divisible by 3, p plus 1 is not divisible by 3. So that's the first inference we are drawing. p minus 4 is a prime number. If p minus 4 is a prime number, it will not be divisible by 3 in most instances. Let's come to the exception in a minute. If p minus 4 is not divisible by 3, p minus 1 will also not be divisible by 3. Right. Let's check out if there is an exception. P minus 4 being a prime number will be divisible by 3 only in one instance when P minus 4 is a 3. So that's a only case where P minus 4 is a prime number and it is also divisible by 3 when P minus 4 is a 3. If P minus 4 is a 3, what will be the value of P? P will be 7. We know that P is a two digit number. If P minus 4 is 3, then P cannot, P will be a 7, which is not a two digit number. So P minus 4 cannot be a 3. So we can conclusively establish that there is no exception which will fit our question. So p minus 4 is not divisible by 3 because it is prime. Therefore, p minus 1 is also not divisible by 3. Now look at it. I'm going to plug in p right now into this picture. p minus 1, p and p plus 1 therefore end up being three consecutive positive integers. p is a two-digit positive integer. p plus 1 will certainly be a two-digit positive integer. p minus 1 will certainly be a positive integer. So, these are three consecutive positive integers. In three consecutive positive integers, one number is certainly divisible by 3. We have established that p minus p plus 1 is not divisible by 3. 
P minus 1 is not divisible by 3. So only number that can be divisible by 3 is basically P. So if P is divisible by 3 and P is a two digit number, a two digit number that is divisible by 3 cannot be a prime number. So concluded that P is not prime include using statement 2 alone. So 2 alone has given us a conclusive answer. 1 alone gave us a conclusive answer. So both these statements independently have answered our question. So choice D is the correct answer to this question. Just go through this logic one more. Look at the rational, right? There's a beautiful rational from P minus 4 to P minus 1, P plus 4 to P plus 1, and then using this to evaluate based on three consecutive positive integers. Before you leave, I want you to do two things. One, sign up as a trial user at wzko.in slash core. Start with statistics and average. Build momentum to your GMAT profession and get a handle on the teaching methodology that we adopt. And then subsequently convert it into a paid user and then unlock the remaining 19 topics. It's one of the most comprehensive online courses for GMAT quant. Lastly, subscribe to this channel, youtube.com slash Vizaku. Some of you could might look at the possibility of joining as a member of this channel and enjoy some member-only perks for a small monthly fee. Click on the join button, you'll get a listing of what perks are available that will give you a boost to your GMAT preparation. Best wishes.